Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, NoSQL Data Modeling Using JSON Documents, a Practical Approach, sponsored today by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dave Siglow. Dave is the Director of Technical Product Marketing at Couchbase. A 30-year veteran of the database industry, David previously spent over eight years in senior product management roles at Oracle. Most recently, he was the product lead for Oracle NoSQL Database, Oracle Berkeley Database, and Oracle Database Mobile Server Products. Before that, he was a VP Engineering at Sleepy Cat, the company behind Berkeley D Database, and held senior technical roles at Informix, uh, Illustra, and Versita. David started his career as a developer in the oil and gas industry. And with that, I will turn the floor over to David to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and welcome. And thank you everyone for uh, attending today and giving me some of your uh, busy day. Uh, hopefully this will be a useful session for, uh, for you in terms of thinking about how to approach data modeling uh, for NoSQL and JSON documents. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, as um, the introduction mentioned, I am the Director of Technical Product Marketing for Couchbase. This is actually my first marketing job ever. Um, I've usually been on the product side of the house. I describe myself as a database guy. Pretty much you name the database technology, I've probably worked on it, or, or the database company, and I've probably worked for them, or I know a lot of the folks that uh, started them. I've mostly been on the product side of the house, either engineering, product management, QA, support, et cetera. Um, it's kind of exciting to take a different role uh, at Couchbase and work in the technical product marketing space. And my way of looking at technology and databases is they're only really useful when they're deployed and solving real world problems. Uh, if you build a technology and nobody uses it, it was an interesting academic exercise, but we can all go home now. So today we're going to talk about a little bit about what is Couchbase and why people are using NoSQL. Uh, hopefully we'll go through that section fairly quickly and spend most of our time talking about how do you identify the proper application that can benefit from JSON and NoSQL? How do you approach data modeling for that application? How do you approach data modeling for JSON? How do you access that data? How do you migrate data into a NoSQL database, for example? And then we'll leave room at the end for, for Q&A. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about what is Couchbase. Clearly the company I work for, have to give them a plug. So Couchbase provides a couple of different database products that deliver the functionality that's needed for the digital economy kinds of applications. It provides storage, obviously, for JSON data, but it also provides a query interface, a methodology for building indexes on a distributed system, active-active replication. Using Couchbase Mobile, you can build mobile applications that automatically synchronize either with each other in a peer-to-peer configuration or with Couchbase Server as a back-end database. And we've recently announced additions to the product for full text search and analytics. And the interesting thing about this is that it provides a unified programming interface, a unified API to access all of these different functions and a unified administration and management console that lets you configure and manage each one of these services within a single cluster. So you can have clusters of different configurations that have different levels of query support, indexing support, replication. Uh, they can support mobile applications, search, and analytics. What many people are doing kind of in the NoSQL and big data space today is they tend to build specialized clusters. So I have a cluster for my data, I have a cluster for my queries, and I have a cluster for indexing, 
And over here I have Kafka, which is a cluster for my, my replication. And I might have a cluster using Elasticsearch and yet another cluster for Spark. And what we keep hearing from customers is that while this is great when you need it, most applications don't need necessarily the sophistication and the administrative overhead that each one of these clusters, these separate clusters, brings to the table. So for a lot of customers, the fact that they can get a single platform that supports all of this from a unified API and management perspective vastly simplifies their introduction to NoSQL and building applications for the digital economy. Very quickly, uh, some of the customers who are using Couchbase, NoSQL generally, but Couchbase specifically, include top companies in the e-commerce, the global distribution services for travel, um, media companies, gaming companies, and financial services companies. And here's the obligatory logo slide. We also see adoption for NoSQL in general, Couchbase specifically, in areas like healthcare, uh, manufacturing, utilities, but probably these five areas are the places we've seen the biggest adoption for the technology and for the company. Um, healthcare is certainly an interesting space that's growing quickly, but hasn't quite uh, gotten there yet. I think uh, we'll start to see much more healthcare adoption uh, in 2017. Customers approach NoSQL from different perspectives. Uh, if you look at customers like Gannett and Marriott, they both had very large relational database implementations that were kind of their legacy systems that they built 15, 20 years ago and have been fine tuning and trying to get more performance and scalability out of over the last five, 10, 15 years. For them, their adventure to NoSQL started with, okay, let me identify the places where I can replace or enhance my relational database and slowly introduce or gradually introduce NoSQL into my infrastructure. If you look at folks like eBay and cars.com, they had a slightly different problem. They couldn't approach the problem gradually because they had a scalability problem that was just hitting them in the face now. They were reaching the limits of the performance and scalability they could get out of a relational database. So eBay and cars.com, for example, were customers who said, we need to embrace NoSQL now. This is not a, this is not a gradual process. This is, we need to look at our services-oriented architecture and implement NoSQL-based applications immediately in order to scale and give our customers the rich personalized experience that they want. And then finally, Equifax is a good example of a customer who looked at NoSQL and said, you know, I need to build a brand new application that does something we don't provide today. And I could try to fit this application onto my existing data warehouse framework that has all these years of credit history, or I could build it so that it uses NoSQL and interfaces with the data warehouse, which is exactly what Equifax did. So they enhanced their data warehouse by adding a new capability and a new type of application to their infrastructure. For those of you not familiar with what NoSQL is, um, it's essentially a non-relational database. It's not uh, the fact that it doesn't have SQL because some NoSQL databases do, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the, in the, later in the presentation. It doesn't really mean not only SQL because it's actually probably a subset of SQL for many NoSQL products. Basically means that data is not being stored using the standard relational assumptions. And part of that affects data modeling, which we'll talk about today, and other parts of that non-relational aspect also affect transactions and how the database actually treats data. Most of the NoSQL systems out on the market are distributed. They're built so that you can essentially store your data across a set of nodes in a cluster. And the idea is instead of buying bigger and bigger machines, you simply add more machines to your cluster. You scale out instead of scaling up. The data itself 
is partitioned automatically and replicated for high availability and scalability. In other words, NoSQL systems keep multiple copies of the data and then for high availability and then distribute those copies across the cluster so that if a given node fails, the data is still available from one of the other nodes where the copies reside. And the NoSQL databases kind of manage that automatically. Most NoSQL databases are schema-less, which means that you can store data and retrieve data without having to specify a schema beforehand. And some of them support JSON, including Couchbase. Others support other data formats. In the last year, what we've seen in the NoSQL space is that companies have gone from being a single storage model or a single modeling solution to multi-model. So now what you'll find in the NoSQL space isn't necessarily a document database or a graph database or a columnar database. You'll see different combinations of data models depending on kind of what their customers are asking for. Um, in the case of Couchbase, we are a key value and document NoSQL databases. So you can store data in both types of models, in both types of structures. So why are customers looking at NoSQL? Uh, fundamentally, there are technology drivers in the digital economy that are pushing customers um, both online and pushing for customized, personalized customer experiences. And enterprises are looking at this and saying, okay, I've got more data, I've got more applications sharing data, and that the internet is connecting all of my applications together. I'm moving some of my applications to the cloud. And these are a series of things that are kind of pushing the company to innovate technology that they might have had for quite a while. So the technical needs are there are huge amounts of innovation. And therefore, I need something that's basically very flexible and very simple to change and update. And I need to be able to operate at any scale. I need to be able to deploy something. It might start out small, but I need to be able to quickly grow it in response to customer demand or the number of applications that come in and start sharing and using that data. And from a business need, timeliness is crucial. If you look at companies like Uber and Lyft and Viber, a lot of these companies are coming in and disrupting existing companies and existing economies, and they're doing it by innovating first. And that's one of the things that customers have seen quite a bit is that if they don't move quickly and if they don't reproduce their cost of operations and increase their revenue, they will be left behind. They will become the laggards, even if they own that space to begin with. One of my favorite examples is Pokemon Go. That team had no way of predicting how fast their application was going to need to scale. And one of the things that helped them was that the fact that they had implemented using Couchbase and so could quickly scale their cluster in response to increasing customer demand. And this is kind of all being driven by the requirements within the digital economy. So as application developers, architects, data modelers, the big question that a lot of folks are struggling with is, okay, how do I use NoSQL and relational and how do I combine them? Do I replace my relational databases or do I complement it? Do I extend it? And it really depends on what it is you're trying to do. Wherever it's possible for NoSQL to be the database of record, then customers are often replacing their relational databases with NoSQL. For example, shopping carts, session data management, um, anything that is specifically object-driven and needs high performance and high scalability is something that customers look at and say, oh, I could use NoSQL for that. That could be my database of record. And for that, I'm not going to use a relational database anymore. I might still use relational databases for other things, but wherever it's the database of record, I'm going to choose to replace my existing technology. There are other customers who look at it, and we mentioned Gannett and Marriott earlier, 
where they look at NoSQL as adding performance, scalability, availability, flexibility to existing infrastructure and will basically say, I'm going to extend what I do currently with my relational database by adding NoSQL to my infrastructure. Bottom line, almost every single customer I talk to runs both relational and NoSQL databases in their shop. There's no wholesale flip a switch, move to NoSQL, because there are things that relational databases that have been developed over the last several decades do really well. And to add to the confusion, NoSQL vendors, including ourselves, are adding features that you typically find in a relational database, including things like security, query language, analytics. Things that you traditionally found in a relational database are starting to appear in NoSQL databases to increase the number of use cases that they can be applied to. And relational database vendors are starting to introduce NoSQL features like automatic sharding, like support for JSON, some forms of distributed processing. So you kind of need to look at what is the problem you're trying to solve and which technology is the best one to solve it with. Most customers decide to make the migration from relational to NoSQL for those top four reasons. It's easier to scale, you get better performance, significant cost savings in terms of infrastructure purchases, and it's highly flexible. What's interesting to me is two years ago, the number one reason why people were moving from relational to NoSQL was cost. They were looking at their expensive relational database licenses and thinking, I could do that functionality with a NoSQL database and save a huge amount of money in the process. Last year, according to a study from the IDC, that changed, and the number one reason is now agility, performance, and scale. It's interesting that cost has gone to third or fourth place in the decision matrix that customers are making about when to migrate or why to migrate to NoSQL, which to me is very interesting. It means that customers are starting to identify the needs of the digital economy, the needs for flexibility and scalability as being even more important than simple cost savings, which motivated a lot of them uh, in 2010, 2011, 2012. So how do you get started with NoSQL? Um, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about how to identify the right application, how to model your data, access it, and how to migrate it. In terms of identifying the right application, um, the best thing you can do is find applications that are service-oriented and compartmentalized so that you can identify the pieces that you want to migrate or the services that you want to migrate to NoSQL. One of the mistakes that some customers make is they look at their legacy system, which is full of spaghetti code, and they try to renovate, innovate, re-implement that in a six-month to nine-month project. And that those kinds of projects are usually doomed to failure. Customers who are most successful are the ones who find those applications or components of an application that you can identify and say, I'm going to just, I'm going to put NoSQL in right here for this service or this function. Generally speaking, you should look for applications that are going to benefit from the features and characteristics of NoSQL, right? Applications that need fast innovation, that need fast scalability, that need high availability, that need global data distribution around the world, are the applications that, you know, should come to mind about, oh, these are the ones where NoSQL could actually bring benefits. You don't really want to change a relational database application that's working just fine and replace it with NoSQL for the sake of using the new technology. You want to get benefits from it. What most of our customers have done is they've looked at their infrastructure and have identified things like a caching service in front of their relational database or they've identified a specific application that has a very narrow application scope and data management and they'll identify that as a candidate for NoSQL or they'll identify a physical or logical service within a large application where they can say this service is going to start using NoSQL 
and especially if they have an API that allows them to abstract the storage layer underneath, the application may not need to change at all. The application still calls the middle tier API that manages storage in the database, but underneath it's actually starting to use NoSQL. So if you've picked your database, if you've picked your application, if you said, okay, I'm gonna start looking at using NoSQL for this application, and the next question is, well, how do I design the schema? How do I design, how do I model my data? And the first thing that kind of helps when we talk about this is to kind of clarify a little bit on terminology. Um, all of the NoSQL vendors use slightly different terminology, but we pretty much mean the same thing. Um, we use servers in a cluster. So whenever we talk about a database, we're talking about a cluster of systems, a cluster of nodes where different services and different amounts of data are stored. And when we talk about a logical database, it's essentially a bucket or a collection of documents or objects as opposed to a database or a table. So you'll often hear us talk about at Couchbase buckets and at other, in other products, for example, collections. And each row in a relational table is essentially, in our world, a JSON document. It's a document or an object. When you think about how to approach data modeling in a NoSQL world, the two differences are primarily that in the NoSQL world, you have relaxed normalization. In other words, you don't have to, the database doesn't enforce schema adherence whereas in the relational world, it does. Of course, the advantages in the relational world we're very familiar with. You know, if you've normalized the data and you're not storing the city name in every record, you're storing the city ID, and then you're looking up the city name in some ancillary table, that saves a lot of duplicate data and it saves a lot of storage resources. However, it also means that you have to look multiple places to get the data that you need. If I want to display an address, which includes a city ID, I have to go to the city table to look up that city ID. And I may have to go and look up a state table to figure out what the name of the state is. In the case of NoSQL, what you can do is essentially optimize objects for that data access pattern that you have. So all of the data that you need in order to access an object is basically stored and co-located together in a single object. I don't have to go anyplace else to go get the data, which makes data access in NoSQL, generally speaking, really, really fast. I'm not looking up data in multiple tables. I'm looking up data in one place, in one object, because that object has all the data that I need. That object can change as the application changes. I don't have to go in and modify the schema in order to change the data that I'm storing. Because objects in the NoSQL world are typically self-contained, they have all the data that you typically need in order to look at the object, it is a great, it has a built-in kind of architecture to support clustering. Because I can distribute those objects across multiple nodes, but as long as I'm accessing a given object, I'm only accessing one node. Access is very, very fast. In a relational world, if I spread my data out across multiple nodes in a cluster, that means I actually always have to go get data from different nodes, and that can be very slow. And then finally, because my data access is a single object and is very, very fast, I have lower server overhead, I'm not doing joins, I go get the data, and it's a very efficient operation. So I basically can get more operations per second out of my storage, my database storage, than I can necessarily out of a relational. And that's just kind of inherent architectural differences. So JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's based on JavaScript and it's a lightweight data interchange or data format description. And we'll talk more in detail about what's in there. It's generally language independent. Um, lots of languages have support packages for JSON. And in general, it's 
less verbose than other storage formats, and it allows you to represent and contain both objects and arrays inside a structure. And the big payoff is that there's no impedance mismatch. There's no difference really between a JSON job object and a Java object. So JSON to Java or JSON to programming objects, the translation is very lightweight. For those of you that have been using object relational mapping systems or uh, MSs, you know that there's a huge overhead translating relational tables to programmable objects or application objects. In the JSON NoSQL world, that translation is very lightweight. So let's talk a little bit about how JSON works and how the model works. In the relational world, you define a schema, and that schema contains essentially the name of the column and what format it has, and all of the rows in that table look the same. In JSON, the data itself, the object itself, is self-describing. Each record, each object, contains essentially a pair, a attribute name and a value, and it contains multiples of these. So instead of describing what the schema looks like somewhere, each object itself is self-describing. One of the advantages that this provides is that different objects in the database don't need to look the same. In fact, different objects in a, in a JSON document database often look different. Whereas in the relational world, every row in a table looks the same. If I want to add a new attribute, I have to go modify the schema. In the JSON world, I can have these two documents, like the one on the left, which is a user document, and the one on the right, which is also a user document, with different structures. On the left, we have addresses, which are contain a billing address and a shipping address. And on the right, we have an object which contains addresses. And for billing, I actually have an address. But for shipping, I've got a totally different value. I don't have a structure. I have something that just, called, just says same. And it's up to the application to interpret those values. So you can have different types. You can have different fields. And you can change them pretty much on demand. Whatever the application wants to store, as long as it's self-describing in this format, it's valid JSON. And the database, in particular Couchbase, really doesn't care a whole lot about what your JSON structure looks like. It just wants a well-formed JSON object, and it's going to store it alongside a primary key. So when we think about how you change your data model, in the relational world, you have to change the database schema, you have to change the application code, and then you have to modify the interface with the customer. In the document database model, typically all you have to do is modify the interface. So if I'm using a web application, all I have to do is start requesting new fields or add some new fields to my form, store those as part of my JSON object, and I'm done. I made that modification. I deployed it. Customers are starting to supply that data, or I'm starting to provide that data to customers or the application without having to change the underlying scheme in the database or change the application itself. The first object that we think about when we think about objects inside the database is basically the object ID the primary key. Now, you can certainly create object IDs that are just a sequence of numbers. You know, um, you can create them so that they're a UUID, and each value, each object has a unique value associated with it. Our most successful customers have looked at those keys and said, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to actually build keys that are strings that are human readable and easy to identify. And the reason why you do this is so that your application can easily construct an object ID dynamically. If I'm looking for information about an author named Shane, I know what the primary key or object ID is for that. I don't need to look for it anyplace else. It's author colon colon Shane. If I'm looking for 
a blog entitled NoSQL Fueled Hadoop, I don't need to go look for what the ID of that thing is. I know what the ID is. It's blog colon colon NoSQL Fueled Hadoop. So most of our customers today are building kind of human readable application constructible keys that are easier to find and don't have to, don't require an external lookup. There is a trade-off. Larger keys, the larger the key is, the fewer keys you're going to be able to fit in memory in the database cache. So if you make huge keys that are 128 bytes long, that will work. But you're going to be able to fit fewer of those object IDs or keys in memory. So there's a balance between making it human readable, parsable, verbose, and making it so verbose that you are consuming more memory than you want to in storing these keys in the cache. The second thing to think about when you're modeling your data, so we've defined our object ID, and we know what that kind of looks like, is defining how objects relate to each other or the relationships between objects. And there's essentially two models. There's a bottoms up model which says their objects belong to other objects. And that determines where you place the foreign keys. So you might have on the left hand side a comment which in turn points to a blog and blogs point to authors. And that's where you put your foreign keys. The reason you would do this is if your primary access pattern goes in that pattern. If your primary access pattern, however, is the reverse, then what you might do is a top-down model, where, for example, your author has multiple blogs, and those could be foreign keys, or they could be nested objects. And each blog has a series of comments associated with it again, as separate objects or nested objects. We've kind of broached this subject, so why don't we go ahead and dive in. In the relational world, you would typically have multiple tables in order to express relationships. In the JSON NoSQL world, you get to decide, decide as a modeler whether you want to have nested objects or related objects. In the case on the left-hand side, you have a document user that's an object, and it points to two other objects, which are addresses for that specific object. So in the case on the left-hand side, we basically are storing three separate objects in the database, and we're building in essentially a foreign key into the parent object pointing at the lower ones. In the other example on the right-hand side, the nested example, we're only storing a single object, and that object has embedded objects inside it, including a object called addresses, which contains two addresses, and an object which is called accounts, which is an array of different accounts. So you get to choose which one of these two you use. And the question often becomes, so which one do I choose? You gave me this flexibility, now what do I do? Well, here's a simple cheat sheet for thinking about, should I create related objects or should I create nested objects? And most of it has to do with how do you access the data and what are the read and write characteristics of your applications? So if you basically have most of your reads are only on parent fields and never, you never use the children, then you might store the children as separate documents, as separate objects. And the reason for that is if I'm only retrieving the parent and I don't have to go get the kids, then that becomes a very efficient operation. However, if my application always gets both the parent and the kids, every time I get a blog entry, I also get all the comments, then that might mean that it's better to store them as a single nested object or an object with nested objects inside of it, again, so that I can reduce the amount of time that I spend going and getting the object. Right? I got the object, it's got the blog and all the comments, I'm done. In the case of rights, you need to think about 
when, how you write, whether you're writing just the parent or the parent and the child together, in which case you make that decision of storing separate or nested objects. And finally, kind of the third dimension on this has to do with concurrency and contention. If you have objects that have a lot of updates that are occurring to them, then you may want to express those as children so that you can essentially parallelize access to the lower, to the child object rather than serializing access through the parent object. Essentially, if you have, if I have an object that's getting thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of updates per second, I'm going to try to model that so that the piece that's highly, that I can, I can basically break out the pieces that are being updated so that I'm not always contending on the entire object. There's a great presentation uh, recorded called the Agile Document Modeling and Data Structures that was recently presented last week at Couchbase Connect. Um, there's a link in the presentation to, that gets you to the on-demand recordings and you can search for the Agile Document Modeling. But that presentation spends about 45 minutes going through different types of trade-offs in JSON object modeling for Couchbase. And it's a great presentation. Uh, it talks about document types, talks about objects versus arrays, talks about different timestamp options and formats. It talks about one of the things that's particular to NoSQL and JSON is you now have trinary logic. You can have empty values, you can have null values, but you can also have missing values where the attribute itself is missing from the JSON structure, and how to deal with that in your application code. It also goes into details about how you can specify schema and some amount of normalization, data standards, data typing standards in the JSON object itself, and libraries that you can use to enforce those JSON schemas in your application. Couchbase, as a database, doesn't today enforce any schema adherence. As far as we're concerned, if it's a well-formed JSON document, we'll store it. If it's not a well-formed JSON document, we'll return an error. But we don't try to enforce any particular schema. There are ways to enforce schema, however, in the application. So you've built and modeled your data. The next question becomes, how do you access your data? In Couchbase, and in most of the other NoSQL products, there are typically different ways of accessing the data. You can access the data in Couchbase via a key value pair API, which allows you to perform CRUD operations, create, retrieve, update, and delete. There is a query interface that allows you to access views, but the one we're gonna focus on today is the nickel or general query interface that lets you access data through indexes. In the relational world, everybody's familiar with SQL. Um, Couchbase introduced Nickel. Uh, let's see, that would have been last year. And it is a SQL for JSON. It has all of the attributes that you'd expect from a SQL language and features that allow you to parse and manage objects that are nested within JSON structures within a SQL statement as well. So an example of nickel queries, these are going to look very much like the SQL that you're used to seeing. The first one simply is a select with a where clause. The second one is a select with a join. So nickel supports joins. And we have the special clause on keys which essentially tells the executor what is the primary key for the table that you're joining to. You can even join on objects by specifying an inner join against a nested object, as in the third case. If 
you're using nested objects, uh, I'm sorry, if you're using related objects, if you, I'm sorry, you're using nested objects as opposed to related. So this first one is, if I've stored multiple objects, here's how I can perform joins between objects. In this case, I've stored objects nested within my records. And in that case, what I'm doing is I'm actually not doing a join, but I'm using the where any clause in order to say, match this to any value that's in that particular array. So where any is one of those extensions that Nickel provides that help you access data. Of course, with Nickel, as with SQL, you can also perform CRUD operations. So you can do insert, update, and delete. We also have an upsert and a merge. So you have multiple ways of inserting, updating, and deleting data directly in Nickel as well. We've talked about queries. Queries require indexes. So in Couchbase, what you do is you have a series of options to create indices including simple single column indexes, compound indexes, functional indexes, you can create an index on a function of a column, and partial indexes, which allow you to essentially create an index with a where clause. In addition to those kind of four fundamental types, there are additional indexing options that you can consider, including array indexing, memory optimized indexing. And then two things that really aren't different indexes but are interesting options to consider as you model your data are to think about indexes as covering. So in a covering index, the entire query can be resolved within the index. It never has to go look at the data. And a duplicate index allows you to create multiple copies of the index and the system will automatically load balance between those. So for example, if I have an index that is, uh, becomes a hotspot, you know, everybody's accessing the data through that index and it's becoming a contention hotspot, one of the things I can do in Couchbase is I can create essentially two copies of that index, one on one node and another index on another node and the system will automatically recognize those two indexes as equivalent and will essentially load balance between the two, which essentially lets you scale indexes even when the index is highly accessed or has hotspots. Some of the things you need to think about in terms of data modeling when you're building indexes and some of the things you need to unremember from your relational days um, are around how indexes function. In the relational world, indexes are synchronous. If I do an update to a piece of data in a relational database, all of the indexes immediately get updated. In Couchbase, index updates are asynchronous. Basically, you write to the data that's transmitted, that's put on a queue and transmitted in memory to the indexing service, and the index is updated asynchronously. And inside your application, you get to say whether you want to wait for the index to be completely updated, the one you're reading, or whether you'll take the index in whatever state it's in. Now, usually the lag behind the data is, we're talking milliseconds. But for some applications, they want to make sure that they're looking at the most recent updated index or that the index is updated at least until the last update that the application wrote. The other thing that you've learned after years of working in relational systems is that indexes slow down writes. If I create a table and I put one or two indexes on it, that's just fine. But if I create 10 indexes, that's going to slow down every write operation to that table. In the Couchbase world, because indexes are asynchronous, it doesn't matter how many indexes you can create. You can create two indexes, 10 indexes, 20 indexes, and your write of the data is not affected. It just puts it on a queue to be sent to the indexing service to be added to the index. In the relational world, if I want to load balance index reads and writes, I have to do it in the application. If I create multiple indices that cover the same set of attributes, 
in most relational systems, I'd have to use a query hint, an optimizer hint, in order to tell it use that index, this index, or that index. Whereas in the, in the Couchbase world, load balancing is automatic. If we see two indexes in the system with the same signature, with the same set of attributes, the system will automatically recognize that it gets to load balance between those two. And in many relational systems, indexes and data kind of conflict and contend with each other in terms of memory usage. In the Couchbase system, using memory optimized indexes, effectively you can pin the index in memory and we actually use a different storage engine that allows us to optimize storage of those indexes. If you have a query planner, parser planner executor, which we do in Couchbase, then you'll be missing your old friend explain from the SQL world, but not in Couchbase because explain will tell you exactly what the query plan was and what indexes were used. So to summarize very quickly, key value pair access in Couchbase is very, very fast, but you're only going after a specific key. MapReduce views are great for certain types of applications, but they're not a general purpose query language. They actually use a specific API to go get what is essentially a materialized view. Whereas nickel queries provide the highest flexibility and allow you to do almost anything you can do in SQL, you can do in nickel as well. And you can create indexes to support your nickel queries. So let's talk quickly about migrating data. One of the challenges of designing a NoSQL system is essentially thinking about how am I going to migrate my data from relational to NoSQL. And some of the things you need to think about is, you know, are these, do I have to do ETL? Is it um, a one-time deal or do I have to do this iteratively? Is it a batch style interface or is it a streaming interface? And essentially what we recommend is, especially for the first implementation, is keep it simple. You can certainly do things easily with Couchbase, such as exporting using comma separated values from a relational database, and then use Nickel to actually load those files, load those records directly into Couchbase doing the ETL directly within Nickel. You could also use SQL from your relational database to perform the ETL and get the data formatted before it goes into Couchbase and then bulk loaded into Couchbase as JSON documents. The most important thing to do is align your data model with your data access model. Plan for failure because there's always going to be bad source data, there's going to be nodes that fail, there's going to be jobs that need to be restarted, and so you need to ensure that it's interruptible and restartable. One of the questions we get asked a lot from customers is how do I keep the two synchronized? And we've seen both of these patterns used by customers. Um, in fact, I saw this presented by several customers at Connect, uh, Couchbase Connect 16 last week, where they were using Kafka as a way of either streaming data to Couchbase or streaming data to the RDBMS as changes occurred or they were using, for those of you that use, for example, Oracle or other relational products that have a gateway product like Golden Gate, often what customers will do is build a handler that allows them to automatically take changes that occur in the, cha in the, in the transaction log and move them to Couchbase as they occur, either in batch or in near real time. So fundamentally, you wanna pick the right application for NoSQL. You want to think about your data model from a data access perspective. You want to define what the document looks like, what's nested versus what's referenced based on how you're going to access your data. And then use indexes to accelerate access to that data. Pick the access method. Here we've focused on nickel as a query language. But you could also pick key value pairs for certain aspects of your application or views for other aspects of your application. And then when you're thinking about your proof of concept, pick the application that's going to have 
high degrees of payback, identify those success criteria, and then review the architecture that you're going to use with the vendor, the NoSQL vendor that you're using. Uh, in the case of Couchbase, we have a team of professional services that can certainly help you review what you're planning on, on building. And with that, I think we have about 10 minutes left for questions. So let's open it up for any questions that might be from the audience. <laughs> I, I love that picture. That's great. <laughs> Actually, I, 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 stole that, I stole that shamelessly from the guy from Equifax. <laughs> That's great. And we do have lots of questions uh, coming in. And uh, just to answer one of the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending a link to the slides and a link to the recording along with anything else requested throughout um, this webinar by end of day Thursday to all registrants. Uh, so keep your eye out for that. It comes from me. Um, so just diving right into it, David, uh, I believe this first question says, I believe column stores in uh, relational databases is faster than NoSQL implementations in most cases. Do you care to comment? It, it depends on the access pattern. Again, if a column, so column stores essentially group sets of attributes together and co-locate them on disk based on the column families. Now, if your queries only need to access the data that's in a given column family, then it can be very fast. And it's particularly fast when you're doing aggregates. If I say I want to sum all of the, the, all of the records, I want to sum this column, let's say uh, average, or I want to average the income in all the personnel records. And all of that data is in a single column family. It's co-located on disk. It's very, very fast to execute. However, for applications that need to access data across column families, it becomes very slow and very expensive because now you're accessing two different locations on disk or two different nodes. So it depends on the kind of application you're building. I would absolutely say if you're doing aggregates and your queries don't span column families, column family store can be a way to go. But if you're spanning column families or you're doing more generalized access, it's not necessarily going to be a win. The other problem you're going to run into with column families is they can become inflexible. So I've defined my column, I've, I've taken my, my record, my object, and I've broken it up into column families. And now all of a sudden I realize I need the data from that column family to move over to this other column family. And that's both data intensive and operationally intensive to do. And uh, so document stores, in that case, it may be just this question of, oh, I need to just add this attribute to this object. Thank you. And what are the implications for data consistency and data quality? It seems like this works great for narrowly defined applications like mobile apps. What about large scale integrations? So data governance and data consistency is kind of the, I think it's the emerging question in the NoSQL space, especially coming from DBAs who are used to kind of managing and making sure the data is clean. Uh, there's a lot of people who kind of say that data, DBAs have gone away in the NoSQL world. I, I don't think so. I'm an ex-DBA myself. Um, in general, you have the same kinds of issues with data cleanliness that you have in a relational database, only now since the application is very much, since the data is very much application controlled, some of that uh, control and monitoring and consistency is going to have to reside in the hands of the, the application developers. And, and there you have to have certain agreements and standards. Uh, there's nothing saying that I can't say, for example, I can't go into the database and say, give me all the people, all the person objects that are missing this attribute because some bad application programmer didn't store that attribute with it. And I can find all the records that have that characteristic. So Nickel allows you to build, for example, data cleansing, data governance, data um, uh, standardization scripts that you can do to examine, monitor, and audit the data. But in the NoSQL world, it is true that the database is not enforcing consistency or normalization. It's pretty much the application. Um, when applications share data, when multiple applications share data, that may or may not be a problem depending on 
how those applications interact. Uh, one of the advantages of NoSQL is different applications can look at and manage different attributes or different objects within the JSON store without having to necessarily coordinate and modify each other's schemas. I can, I'm application A, I can add an attribute to that object and maybe I'm the only application that cares about that particular attribute that I just added. Application B will get that attribute when it return, when it gets the JSON object, but it's basically going to ignore it because it doesn't need it. I didn't have to go to a DBA for application A to start storing and managing that particular object or attribute within the JSON object. So it does provide with a higher degree of flexibility. There still does need to be some coordination uh, between, for example, application teams in terms of uh, what they're reading and writing. So th this questioner goes on to uh, uh, to expand, and says, you know, if everyone gets to define what they mean by X, Y, Z, it seems like the integration requirements for widely shared data could get large beyond measure. Is there something I'm missing? No, actually, there's nothing you're missing. Um, that's a good question. What we've seen in our customer communities is that either customers will start to build, you know, separate objects for separate applications, or they'll have some rules about these, these particular attributes belong to that application, and they're stored with the object and um, get retrieved by that application and used by that application. So um, we've actually seen customers go from two or three applications sharing a common data source to literally tens of applications sharing a data source. And in 90% of the cases, they're all accessing and managing the same set of attributes or characteristics of the JSON object. In some cases, they're adding um, additional ones that are application specific. I don't think the management becomes untenable, but it is, it, it is something you have to manage in the process. Just like in the relational world, before I can go add an attribute, I have to go pay homage to the DBA and, you know, IT tells me, oh, yeah, it'll take X amount of weeks or months to add that particular attribute to the table and then upgrade the table. You're paying the cost of normalized data management at the database implementation level. On the NoSQL side, the cost doesn't go away. You still have to coordinate that, but you're not paying it down in the database you're paying it at the application design and coordination level. So I don't think there's a magic bullet in either case. What NoSQL tends to do is make it easier to change and more flexible. Well, and speaking of changes, and, and you know, in the discussion of keys, making the key deterministic was listed as a best practice. How is the concept of a key changing, for example, author Shane changes name handled in the model? So um, if you're changing the primary key, it's the same thing as, a, as essentially a delete and an insert. Um, when the primary key or object ID, when that changes, the object goes away and you know, gets deleted and comes back. Um, you can, we do have verbs like merge and upsert that allow you to insert an object, uh, a JSON object if it doesn't already exist or update it if it does. So we have verbs within nickel that make it easier to manage kind of those, those things. Um, but you can certainly change the primary key if you want. That will essentially result in a delete of the old record and delete of the old object and insert of the new object in the specific node where it belongs based on the hashing of the object ID. Perfect, and, and we got a lot of um, great presentation comments here, and, uh, and specifically from this questioner who says, you know, um, I'm just wondering how to access control uh, is done in NoSQL. I'm sorry, I don't think I understood the question. Um, I'm just wondering how, uh, the question is, you know, I'm just wondering how access control is done in NoSQL. Ah, I, I think you're talking, asking about security. Um, so security varies by NoSQL product. All of the NoSQL vendors are kind of scrambling to implement security and do um, access control lists um, and those kinds of, of uh, features. 
Um, in Couchbase today, most customers control access to the data via the application. Uh, they can identify and authenticate users, and then they manage user access to specific data within the application. Uh, in an upcoming release of Couchbase, we'll have role-based authorization controls, RBAC controls, which would allow the customer to implement access controls directly in the database as opposed to in the application. And you're going to find that varies depending on the NoSQL vendor that you talk to. Dave, we are right at the top of the hour. We have a ton of uh, additional great questions coming in, um, but maybe if I can get those over to you, that would be yes. uh, certainly so, appreciated. You know, just very quickly, I know, um, are there any modeling tools uh, to, to use alongside Couchbase? Or? I, I knew that would come up. There are a few... <laughs> There are a few JSON modeling tools, but they're, they're, fair, they're not terribly sophisticated because JSON is self-describing. So mostly what you're going to find are JSON editors, um, which are, you know, fine. There are some relational data modeling tools that via uh, JDBC and ODBC can talk to a NoSQL database, but essentially those tools come with them the concept of normalized data and flattened structures, right? They don't su typically support nested objects. So although you can use uh, relational modeling tools with some NoSQL databases, including Couchbase, um, you're essentially, you know, kind of hamstringing yourself from the beginning. Um, I have yet to find a JSON modeling tool that's more than kind of a JSON editor uh, that I really like yet. Um, I am on the hunt, though, if anybody is, uh, is building one. For folks in the audience to wrap up real quickly, uh, if you're interested in learning more about uh, Couchbase or about data modeling, uh, here's some resources that you can look at. Um, I also have in the slide deck some general resources about Couchbase if you're interested in downloading and trying it out, but some specific resources around data modeling. Um, I included the data modeling and data structures uh, reference to Couchbase Connect 16 in this, but there were several data modeling related presentations last week in, in Couchbase Connect that if people are looking to explore this more in depth, uh, could be very useful. David, thank you so much for this great presentation and for these resources. I will likewise include that in the follow-up email, which will go out to all registrants by the end of day Thursday with links to the slides and the recording as well. Uh, and thanks to all our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love all the fantastic questions coming in and certainly appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great day. And thanks to Couchbase for sponsoring today's webinar. It was really a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, David.